which fish should I eat? Which fish are sustainable? I get asked these questions all the time. Should I avoid cod? Should I feel guilty about bluefin tuna? Oysters, they're okay, right? I get asked these questions because of my personal connection to the sea. I'm a part-time commercial fisherman. I've been a deckhand on a gillnet boat catching fluke in Block Island Sound. I've been a deckhand on a lobster boat at the mouth of Narragansett Bay. And at present, I'm a shellfish harvester, digging razor clams and setting conch pots in the estuaries and the coastal salt ponds of Rhode Island. So I've sort of become a go-to person on seafood issues. But for some reason, I'm always a little bit uncomfortable with this question of which seafood should I eat. There's something about splitting the sea into sustainable and unsustainable components that doesn't quite mesh with my worldview as a commercial fisherman. So today, I'm not going to help you learn to make more selective seafood choices or to help you partition the seafood counter into unsustainable and sustainable options. Instead, I'm going to draw on what I've seen as a commercial fisherman to shift your thinking about what it takes to make our seafood sustainable. I want to move you to action, but not from the familiar setting of a seafood counter, but from a slightly less familiar place for most of you, the deck of a fishing boat. And in this process, I want to illustrate why selective choice may be exactly the wrong value to emphasize if we want to achieve the resilience of our marine ecosystems and the permanence of our fishing industry. So let's start by imagining seafood from three different vantage points. Most consumers visualize seafood laid out on ice at the seafood counter. The seafood counter can be the setting for that sometimes stress-inducing question of what fish do I eat? The role of the consumer in this setting is to evaluate all available options and pick one, perhaps because of flavor, perhaps because of price, or if he's a conscientious consumer, he might pick one that's on his green list or one that's marked as certified sustainable. At the seafood counter, sustainability is considered to be an attribute of the individual fish itself, not an attribute of the marine ecosystem that it came from. The way that a fisherman interacts with seafood is slightly different. A fisherman first encounters his catch as it comes over the rail. It's often full of surprises. The fisherman also has to make a choice, but his choice isn't a multiple choice from an array of options. It's a binary decision. Do I keep this fish or do I throw it back? A fisherman has some control over what he catches based on what gear he uses and where and when he goes fishing, but to a large extent, he's at the mercy of whatever the ocean decides to deliver. The fisherman's stance is as old as the ages. Boots on deck, eyes on the sea, and hands on the fish that he's removing from his gear. The fisherman's economic success depends on the area of overlap between what the sea supplies and what the market demands. And there's almost always some degree of mismatch between those two things. Because the seafood market only accepts certain species to the seafood counter. Finally, consider the way that a fish interacts with seafood. Fish are seafood, but they also eat seafood. A typical fish crosses paths with many other species as he makes his way through his habitat, and most of them are things that he would consider eating for dinner. Fish tend to be generalist predators, which means that they shift their diet opportunistically based on whatever is available in a particular place and time. If there's more herring, they'll eat more herring. If there's more mackerel, they'll eat more mackerel. As a result, fish consume a very high diversity of seafood. Each fish is networked to every other part of a highly interconnected food web. From the soup of nutrients to the swirls of plankton, to the swarms of fish, each part plays a unique role in maintaining the structure of the whole. Two types of metamorphosis occur 
during the translation from the ecosystem through the fishing boat to the seafood counter. The first is the disappearance of diversity. As a rich and complex food web is funneled into a highly discriminating seafood market, the diversity of species in the ocean is abbreviated into a short list of items that the American consumer considers to be his seafood choices. At every stage of the process, from ocean to plate, we further winnow down that diversity. We start by picking out the marketable catch and throwing back the rest. Then we pare down the whole fish into a filet. And finally, we offer these remnants to the consumer to make the final call, the choice of what to take home for dinner. Meanwhile, a multi-dimensional, hierarchical food web is collapsed into a flat, one-dimensional lineup of equally weighted seafood options. I emphasize these two points because diversity and food web structure are two key elements of ecosystem health, and yet they're missing from the conventional paradigm of achieving sustainability through consumer-based seafood choice. Diversity is important because it enables ecosystems to adapt. Just as it's wiser for an investor to spread his funds around multiple investments instead of putting it all in one risky gamble, it's important to have all the species and ecosystem present and thriving to carry our ecosystems through to a productive future in the face of changing conditions. And with our ecosystems changing faster than ever before due to climate change and other factors, preserving biodiversity is absolutely key. Food web structure is important because without a stable food web, we can't be sure that every species in an ecosystem has enough to eat to remain viable. And we might experience wild swings in commercial species that could put fishermen in trouble. We can turn to recent history for a couple of examples that show the importance of a food web structure. The Gulf of Maine is a cold, deep water ecosystem to our north. For thousands of years, it was characterized by rich forests of kelp and predatory fish like cod, haddock, and halibut. But in the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries, fishing picked up on these predatory species, and they became both scarcer and smaller. Meanwhile, sea urchins, which had been few and far between during the reign of the predatory fish, began to increase in abundance. Unlike fish, sea urchins are selective feeders, and they like nothing more for dinner than a rich frond of kelp. So as a result of the explosion in sea urchin abundance, kelp forests began to disappear. Then in the 1980s, a commercial fishery began for sea urchins for the export market, so their numbers went back down. And without the sea urchins, the kelp began to revive. Now, this ecosystem is a rich habitat for crabs and lobsters, which love to take refuge between the leafy fronds of kelp. Their predators, the predatory finfish, still haven't come back. So what we have now is what some have called a lobster monoculture. And while we all love lobsters, this, from an ecological point, indicates a low diversity and a truncated food web structure. And it's not just an economic problem. I mean, it's not just an ecological problem, it's also an economic problem. Because fishermen have little to fish for now besides lobsters, and yet, the lobster market has become saturated and can bear no more. Arguably, if we had exploited cod, haddock, halibut, crabs, lobsters, and urchins all at once, instead of sequentially, one by one, we could have averted this situation. George's Bank is the shallow, offshore, underwater plateau to our east, traditionally a super-rich fishing grounds for ground fish, which is a category of fish that includes cod, haddock, and various flounder species. But in the latter half of the 20th century, fishing on these species spiked upwards, and their numbers began to decrease. There was a concurrent rise in the numbers of species like skates and dogfish. And one of the possible explanations for why this occurred is that skates and dogfish are not as popular in the American seafood market as ground fish, so they were thrown back, where they survived and prospered. Skates and dogfish, coincidentally, 
enjoy many of the same food species as groundfish, so they took up the slack where the cod and other groundfish were missing. They seem, in a way, to have replaced these species in George's Bank. So the end result is an ecosystem with a high abundance of low market value species and a low abundance of the species that the market desires. There is a lesson in these stories. If we want to assure ecological and economic sustainability, we cannot decouple the sustainability of an individual fish from its role in the larger ecosystem. Let's stop using the word sustainability to refer to a piece of biomass that's been removed from its habitat and placed on the seafood counter. Let's start using this word to describe our desired relationship with the entire food-producing ecosystem that is our ocean. Every time we eat seafood, we're actually eating an entire food web that's embedded in the flesh of the filet on our plate. So the challenge is to eat that food web consciously, using our eating habits to bring it back into balance rather than to distort it. Lastly, our ecosystems are also changing for reasons that have nothing to do with the seafood that we put on our plates. In the coming years, the biggest changes that we're going to see are the result of burning fossil fuels. As our waters warm due to global climate change, we can expect some species to do better, some to do worse, and many to move northwards. Here in our local waters of southern New England, we're seeing an increasing scarcity of species like cod and lobster, and that's no surprise, because cod and lobster are northern species, and this is the southern edge of their range. Meanwhile, we're seeing an increase in southern species like croaker and blue crab that are increasing in our local waters as they move northward. As the climate changes, the best thing we can do to enable our ecosystems to adapt is to be more flexible in our seafood eating habits. So how can we balance the demands of our seafood diet with the ocean's changing supply? The answer is to let the ecosystem select our seafood for us, to match the variety of seafood on our plate to the great diversity found in the sea, and to eat seafood species in proportion to their natural abundance. We already have a model for this style of eating, and that model is the fish. Remember that fish tend to be generalist predators, shifting their diet opportunistically to keep up with whatever is abundant in their local waters at a particular time. Consumers can make a real contribution to sustainable seafood by eating more like a fish. But do you start eating like a fish? It's not enough just to go to your seafood counter and ask for whatever is local, wild, and seasonal, although that's a good start. Because of the fact that our seafood counters only include such a slim segment of the species that are found in our waters, we must perform a sort of affirmative action on our seafood counters. We should go to our seafood purveyors and ask them to offer a more representative variety of the di diversity of our fruits of our oceans. And finally, while we eat like a fish, we also need to keep in mind that there's still a lot of mystery in our ecosystems and still a lot that we need to understand about the way we impact them. And that's why, while we change our eating habits on our plate, we must also support ecosystem-minded scientists in our universities and in our public agencies and urge the incorporation of fishermen's knowledge into the models used to understand and manage our fishery resources. As members of the public, you aren't just consumers of seafood, you're also the owners of fishery resources. All the fishery resources between the shore and three miles out are owned by the residents of the states, and all of the resources between five miles and 200 miles out are owned collectively by the American public. So while we choose and eat our seafood individually, we manage these resources collectively. So, I urge you to exercise that ownership by supporting policies that ensure a future for our wild seafood, for our commercial fishermen, and for the vibrant marine ecosystems without which neither one of these things would exist. Seafood is one of our last obvious, tangible connections to the natural world. 
And fishing is one of the world's oldest and most unique occupations, and it's one that I feel incredibly privileged to be part of. Without seafood, we would lose the immediate incentive to conserve the vast oceans that cover our ocean surface, our planet's surface. And without fishing, we would lose the eyes and the ears out there on the water every day, noting the changes in our ecosystems. So let's develop a sustainable seafood paradigm that increases market access for fishermen while bringing our eating habits back into balance with the patterns of the marine ecosystem. Let's eat like a fish. And because I know that some of what I've said today may be a little bit new uh, to some of you, I've also encapsulated it in a short verse that you can recite to yourselves next time you're at the seafood counter. For a sustainable seafood dish, try eating more like a fish. Avoid food web distortion, mimic nature's proportions. That's right, be a generalist. The variety of sea life is broad, so don't just eat boring old cod. Most sea species are edible and quite unforgettable, even if at first some look odd. Let the ocean select today's flavor. That's truly the best way to save her. The ecological fix is to consume a true mix. So just vary the seafood you savor. Thank you. Fair winds and bon appetit. <laughs>